Alrighty guys, welcome to the live stream today. This is going to be the nice Powell stream out here. So hope everybody's ready for some price action out here in the stock market. Boy, it is crazy out here today. A lot of chop on the spy, but I'll tell you what, there's a few stocks going crazy. AVGO reported some new chips or something. They've been exploding this morning. AMD is their competitor and they're getting sold off. So you know, there's some pretty stark differences out of these stocks here today, even going through the Mag 7 real quick. You know, Apple doing pretty well. Microsoft, you know, down a little bit more, right? Like we're seeing that big difference out there. There's not like, it's not like everything's running up or everything's running down necessarily, but there are those nice individual runners here today. Bringing up the watch list from this morning, Dwack continued climbing now up 18% on the day. One hell of a move by Dwack. Coinbase has had some pretty good price action today as well. Continued at the top of my watch list almost all morning. I know that these airlines and stuff were starting to come back a little bit today too. 
started to consolidate slightly heading into this event. And I am actually not going to be surprised by any consolidation at all. So whenever I'm looking at the market right now, the SPY is running up. It's right around the all-time highs. It's only $2 away, essentially. You know, it's not like we're really that far. If Powell does get a, get the market to move up, that could be a pretty good run to the upside. We could probably break 518, actually. You know, sometimes these moves can end up resulting in some, or these events can result in some pretty insane moves. So, gotta watch the support closely, though. 515 is a major level. I've had this on the chart for a few days now, so... Keep your eyes on 515. Maybe we start break, start to break under there. But I know everyone's looking at the FedWatch tool. They're like, hey, what's going on? Are we going to cut? Are we going to pause? Or are we going to hike? Yeah, I've even heard some people ask, hey, are we going to have a hike? Like, oh my God, like that sounds insane. Could you guys imagine a hike right now? But the percentages are pretty good. We have 59.8% chance of a cut coming in June. And that's going to be the big thing that everyone looks for is the June numbers. This time, there's a 99% chance of a pause. So if it does cut, that would be pretty insane to say the least. What's up though, guys? Xbox, Caleb, Manny, Oscar, Jose, Sean. Man. Board was pretty good today. Like to see that one continuing up. 1265 continuing. I know that, that'll make Sean happy right there. We should get this interest rate decision though coming out very, very soon in just about four minutes. Three and a half minutes. It's going to be a fun play here today. I'm really watching those uh, rates, yields. Really watching those U.S. government 10-year bonds, obviously. The U.S. 10-Y is going to be huge. Right at resistance. I would say the market would be a lot better off with this going down. How do I feel about Coinbase? C-O-I-N? Ha, <laughs> Sean's happy. I knew it. I knew he'd be happy from that. Break time from painting. Hell yeah, Paul. What are you painting on? That's pretty cool. Coinbase pretty wild today overall. I know Bitcoin was on fire. I could see Coinbase continuing. I mean, look at Bitcoin getting some good moves here at lunchtime. I could see Coinbase actually continuing to go. I like the setup here today too. Not a bad setup by any means but get ready for the news guys eta in about two minutes all right all right all right oh yeah everyone's ready for it we all know it's going to be a pause this time the big thing though is just the future that's really what everyone's watching if it's not a pause this time that will be one of the biggest surprises i think i've ever seen there's no way they're going to cut it right here. Give me one sec, one sec. Okay, so I had to check something really quick. Go switch over to Boeing. They've been actually holding up very, very well today. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that one. It's been a pretty popular stock lately, actually. I can't believe SMCI is down so much still. Not good to see by them. Another 5%. I mean, they did have that offering, so surprise, surprise that the stock's falling. How do you guys like that offering? That was pretty messed up, didn't you think? All right, let me get my spy news up here and ready. Just to CNBC real quick too. Let's go guys. Let's get the four chart setup up here.
buys at the top left, just for everybody that's wondering. Tesla, bottom left. NVIDIA, top right. Apple, bottom right. And here we go. The SPY is popping right off the bat. So that's pretty fire. But keep in mind that this price action can get crazy. We'll see how it goes. Watch that all-time high coming into play around 518. It's only like a dollar away now. Man, look at those four big stocks right there in the market. Woo! Gotta take a screenshot of this. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get the news. All right, reading through it here. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. Job gains have remained strong and the unemployment rate has remained low. Inflation has eased over the past year but remains elevated. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment and inflation at the rate of 2% over the long run. The committee judges that the risk to achieving its employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. The economic outlook is uncertain and the committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks. In support of its goals, the committee decided to maintain or pause the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data. The evolving outlook and balance of risks. So I'll read that again. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. That is a pretty big statement right there. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably towards 2%. In addition, the committee will continue reducing its holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities as described in previously announced plans. The committee is strongly committed to returning inflation to 2%. So there it is. That's the main, that's the main substance of that article there. In assessing the appropriate stance of monetary policy, the committee will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information for the economic outlook. The committee would be prepared to adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate if risks emerge that could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. The committee assessment will take into account a wide range of information, including readings on labor market conditions, inflation pressures, and inflation expectations, and financial and international developments so there we go they do in a pause and it looks like that tone kind of made it seem like they were looking to pause for a little longer so here's the percentages before this came out 59.8 percent for a cut in june we will refresh this and see what it is at now it might take a few minutes to update yep gotta take a few minutes but that will change and we'll see that start to move around a little more but so far, so good. SPY is uh, looking pretty fire. Great movement to the upside at this time. One thing that we are seeing is if you go look at the dollar, that thing is getting crushed right now. The dollar is all is down quite a bit, guys. That is a nasty red candle on the dollar. Let's look at US 10Y as well. Also a fairly nasty red candle right there. Although it came back, it's, it's kind of volatile, but... That's what we're looking at so far. That is what we're looking at. That dollar move, though, is pretty nuts. Can't lie. That was a pretty harsh reversal. That was a great move heading into this morning. What do you guys think? I am very curious here. We have about 25 minutes until the man, the myth, the legend gets his ass on stage and starts speaking. We'll see... Uh, what the market wants to do till then. Spy bounce right off that 515 support, moving up in a good way, almost up to all time highs. If we go to like a five minute chart, you guys can see that. Probably even better on a 15 minute chart. Yep. Even better here.
What website do you go to for the rate sentiment? OGS. Yeah, I go to the CME FedWatch tool. It's cmegroup.com. Just Google CME FedWatch tool. For anyone who doesn't know, the CME is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Very popular with uh, futures and just a lot of things in general. CME group. I believe that's what it is. Man, SPY though, literally right at the all-time high as we speak, guys. Look at that. Brand new all-time highs are literally like right where the stock market is right now. Man, what is the high on this candle? Oh yeah, there it is. New highs. There we go. There it is. New all-time highs. The SPY popped up pretty quickly on that. Pretty quickly. Now, it broke the all-time high slightly, but it's not really holding above there. But it's volatile right now. If it's going to run, it should get a decent continuation up there. But let's go. New all-time highs. I'm sure a lot of you guys out there are real happy, especially the people out there who are smart enough to have the long-term accounts going. Probably loving it out there right now. Fantastic price action this far, though. We'll see if Big Daddy Powell comes in and ruins it or not. We still have plenty of time till he starts speaking, so... Like Manny said, follow the data. The thing I'm really worried about is the data starting to show that pausing goes for longer. We'll see what, what JP says here, but... Let's see. Uh, shifting a little bit more towards pause, but nothing insane yet. Hell yeah, Manny. Let's get that momentum to snowball. That's what I want to see. A nice snowball up above the all-time high. That would be beautiful. How's NVIDIA looking? Nice. Very nice. They came back. Makes sense. Makes sense. How's AMD? Even they're trying to come back. Look at that. SMCI. Wow. Wow. Chip stocks coming back alive today off this. Nice, nice. Let's hope JP doesn't be the Grim Reaper today. Look at Dwack. It's about to run too. <laughs> this one doesn't necessarily follow the market, but hey, decent movement here. All right, we got to do a poll. Got to do a poll. All right, all right. I want everybody to get their votes in for this one. Let's make this one the most voted in poll that we've ever had. That would be pretty sick. Bam, let's go. Three options there on the poll. Market continues higher, cause a pullback, or stays around the 518 high. Vote it up. What do you think JP is going to do? Spy rejecting slightly back down now. These events can have a lot of volatility, guys. I've seen run-ups like this happen, and I've seen the market end up way lower the very next day. So we'll see. We'll see. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen. It would be kind of sick to see a nice break to the all-time high again, honestly. That way, my baby DraftKings can go higher. <laughs> I'll take more, right? I mean, who doesn't want more? Who doesn't want more? Powell might Matumbo us. Give us the big no, no, no. And Disney's starting to tank back off now, too. That's okay, though. I don't really care about them today. I do, but I don't. Man, Spy's already 
Giving up half the half of the move already. All the way back down to 516.80. Come on, Big Daddy. Let's get us higher. <laughs> Spy. It hit the all-time high and comes down. I, I feel bad for anybody who bought at the top. It was so quick, but I wonder what type of shit was triggering there. I'm sure there was... If only we knew what was triggering, right? It would be pretty nuts. Like all the algos and exactly what, what they got. Maybe one day, right? Maybe one day. Hey, Vincent, thanks for the sub. If anybody out there is new to the channel, smash that subscribe button let's go this is not the same channel as the nightly videos so give us some love here got the spy though coming back a little bit nice green candle there gonna switch over to amazon and apple and microsoft real quick see what we got amazon okay holding up but still rejecting apple had a pretty harsh rejection microsoft right back up to the high so you know, from what I'm seeing so far, everything's still looking okay. Everything's still looking okay. There's no need to really, you know, panic on this little downtrend yet. Not quite yet. We'll see, though, how it plays out. We're about 19 minutes away from the man speaking. Greed, yes. Spy puts, Jason said. <laughs> I'm really watching this resistance right here where these wicks are. I just drew it out. I'll draw an arrow to it. I'm curious if it can get back above there. If not, this is going to be like a, a picture perfect head and shoulders pattern right here. Picture. I'll even put a fucking face on here. That's how like picture perfect this thing is. I mean, it's, it's pretty damn perfect if you're looking at patterns out there. Mike Tyson? Hey, what's up, RJ? We have Jerome Paul speaking later. <laughs> There's been a running joke going with Tyson all day, RJ. That's funny. With Powell and Tyson. Sean, Sean can enlighten you if he wants to. Yeah, but Jane, the news is they came in with a pause and they're being careful about the data for the future, especially with inflation not really, you know, going down at the rate that they wanted, right? They're kind of uh, being a little wary of that based off what I read. I read the whole entire thing. It's right here. Let me find the biggest statement I saw. In assessing the appropriate stance of monetary policy, the committee will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information for the economic outlook. That's a pretty big statement. It's pretty big. They say they do not expect it will be appropriate until they've gained greater confidence that the inflation is moving sustainably towards 2%. So that's a big, that's another big statement. But just because they say things doesn't mean that anything's too far away. You know, they're manipulators. That's the big thing out there with them. That's the whole point of the FOMC. Honestly, in my opinion, it is a bunch of manipulation. They know what they're doing. They try to word things certain ways. And people catch on to that. And that's why sometimes the Fed watch tool has totally different percentages from what the Fed say. Oh, yeah, look at that. Here we go. Now, here's some data that should make everybody happy. Here we go. 
everybody ready to hear this? The June cut percentage just rose. It popped above 60% in a huge way, up to 67% now. So that's looking good. Looking good. The June number is getting higher for a cut. That's great. That is fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. I can't wait to see what the Fed dot plot looks like. I want to see how it changed and everything. See a lot of data on that in tonight's video. Make sure you guys check that out. But hey, this is great data here. This is what all the bulls want to hear right there. That's the number. I'm surprised it went this way, but it did. So you got to take it for what it's worth. But we'll see though. The market's still pulling back a little bit. But at least it got that good solid move at first. Even if the market closes under 518, it could still easily go up into tomorrow. It's interesting to see it selling back off though. I'm surprised that percentage shifted that much, honestly. Based off that wording. Dot plot signals three rate cuts in 24. Fewer reductions in 25, 26. For three rate cuts in 24. Well, that's big to hear. One. Yep, and that, that actually lines up with what with what's on here three cuts that lines up very well you got the first one in june the second one in september and the third one in december it came close down there by december but it it, it got in there it's being priced in for the year there honestly some of these are almost even priced in lower but that's good. So three cuts. The Fed's seeing exactly what the market's seeing now, which is good. Yeah, this is a great sign, though, for the market, guys. That's that's good. That's great. I'm really happy with that, actually. The only thing I'm not happy about is this damn price action. <laughs> Why is it falling back down so much with uh, with all that coming in line like that? I know that their wording might have been a little off. Maybe people are really looking for Powell's speech to be kind of rough, you know? Hopefully that's not the case. We'll see. He better not come out here and ruin it for us. He probably will today, honestly. I'd probably that, that damn guy, Powell. <laughs> I actually like Powell a lot, but I know a lot of people out there don't like him. Throw it up in the comments. Let me know if you like Powell. Let me know if you don't. I'm curious. 52 votes. Let's make this the most voted in poll, guys. You got to vote, though, before Powell speaks in 12 minutes. You got to get the votes in. 52 votes right now. Let's make this one the best one ever. 100 plus. Will he help it continue or will he make it stick around the high? That's the big question. I'm going to throw up the four chart setup for one second. Give me just one moment, guys. I will be right back. Got to get ready for Big Daddy.
And we are back. Let's go. Yeah, it's going to be a big day out there. Look at these moves already on these stocks on the four chart setup. That's pretty insane, honestly. That's a pretty big move out of these Tesla, Spy, NVIDIA, Apple. Four of the biggest players out there. That's going to be a fun day, though. It is going to be a fun day, especially once Powell starts to get here in about 10 minutes. ETA, 10 minutes, guys. No joke. NVIDIA is actually powering up pretty well right now. I like this setup. Good potential here. Maybe break 900. I'd like to see that. Oh, yeah, Brad. Let's go. Mike Tyson Powell. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Sean. Exactly. That's what I was thinking of when I said it. The stinky fat mouth. Yeah. I'm glad it's Powell, though, and not somebody else. Low key. At least we got good old JP out here. Terrible treasury auctions, huge tail. Nobody wants US debt. Hashtag higher, longer. Yeah, higher for longer. We'll see what he says. Hopefully, he can keep this nice trend going, though. Hey, nice, Caleb. That's awesome. How long have you been trading for? It's pretty badass to hear. Obviously, only do it when it sounds good, though. Yeah, probably Brannard. One thing I really like about Powell is that he worked at a lot of investment banks and not a lot, but you know, he did that investment banking and did a lot of private sector stuff before the government, which I thought was pretty cool. A lot of these people in government, they just go to college their whole lives and then become government people. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, I always respect somebody that gets out there and gets some, gets some shit done and then kind of more earns that respect, I guess. Hey, nice. About a year and a half, maybe two. That's awesome, Caleb. Very nice. 68 votes. Market continue higher is winning right now. Cause of pullback is close, though, so get those votes in, depending on what you think. Right now, everyone's looking at market continues higher. If you think it could cause a pullback, you might sway the vote. Powell has made himself to be unshakable. Exactly. Being unshakable is a very good attribute out there. Granted, probably couldn't change a tire. Yeah, I could see that. I, I don't know much about her, but I know she was definitely one of the college ones. You can't influence him. He will only follow the data. I really like that, Jason. Yeah, that's a good statement, man. It's a great statement. All right, we're about five minutes away from the man, the list, the, the myth. The legend. You know what that means. Do you know what it means? I know everybody who watches the channel often know what it means.
For those of you that might be joining up right now and you might be wondering what in the hell is going on, that is a tradition that we've done here on the live stream for, I don't even know how many FOMC meetings now, <laughs> probably like 24 of them, but it is tradition around here and it will be done as long as it is possible. But let's go guys, you know, JP will be out here in just a couple minutes, had to keep the tradition going. Appreciate everybody joining up today and getting hyped up. So let's go. 82 votes on the poll. This might be the most voted in poll ever. We're 18 votes away from 100 votes. That's a pretty big poll. Keep up the votes. Looks like market continuing higher is taking the cake, though. Looking good. All hail, Powell. <laughs> Shit. RJ. Hell yeah. Smash it. Smash that button, guys. Let's go, though. I'm glad to hear you guys liked it. At least most of you. Palantir continuing up very well here. Let's go back to that Spy, which is also continuing up in a great way. Palantir is just following along. Bring up the four chart setup as JP starts to come out here. And just so everybody's aware, I will have JP live right here in two minutes if the sound is low just give me a second i will boost the sound i'll make it sound good however i have to do i will make it a-okay sometimes these streams get all messed up i'll be like cnbc what are you doing how did you get it that bad but eta any moment now Let's get it ready. Should be any moment. Let's go back to those percentages real quick, see if they change over the past few minutes. Nice, even higher, almost a 70% now. Very nice. Very, very nice. Glad to see that. I kind of thought it was going to go the opposite way. But I'll take the upwards movement any day of the week. But I will have the spy side by side with Powell here, so let's go. All right, I'm going to have to bring up Bloomberg just in case CNBC's blowing their cover here. Nope, he's not quite out yet, so that's good. One time CNBC was like three minutes late, and they really... Really had me angry that day. <laughs> we all should have sent some dirty letters that day. Yeah, close the effing door before he starts. <laughs> A tradition unlike any other. I like it. All right, here he is, guys. Let's go. Music down. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. Where is he? The economy has made considerable progress toward our dual You know what? Objective. We're going Bloomberg today. The has eased substantially while the labor market has remained strong. And that is very good news. But inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured. And the path forward is uncertain. We are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustainably strong labor market that benefits all. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy has been putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. 
I will have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. <clears throat> Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. GDP growth in the fourth quarter of last year came in at 3.2%. For 2023 as a whole, GDP expanded 3.1%, bolstered by strong consumer demand as well as improving supply conditions. Activity in the housing sector was subdued over the past year, largely reflecting high mortgage rates. High interest rates also appear to have weighed on business fixed investment. In our summary of economic projections, committee participants generally expect GDP growth to slow from last year's pace, with a median projection of 2.1% this year and 2% over the next two years. Participants generally revised up their growth projections since December, reflecting the strength of incoming data, including data on labor supply. The labor market remains relatively tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 265,000 jobs per month. The unemployment rate has edged up, but remains low at 3.9%. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers, reflecting increases in participation among individuals aged 25 to 54 years, and a continued strong pace of immigration. Nominal wage growth has been easing and job vacancies have declined. Although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. FOMC participants expect the rebalancing in the labor market to continue, easing upward pressure on inflation. The median unemployment rate projection in the SCP is 4.0% at the end of this year and 4.1% at the end of next year. Inflation has eased notably over the past year, but remains above our longer run goal of 2%. Estimates based on the consumer price index and other data indicate that total PCE prices rose 2.5% over the 12 months ending in February, and that excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.8%. Longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as from measures from financial markets. The median projection in the SEP for total PCE inflation falls to 2.4% this year, 2.2% next year, and 2% in 2026. <clears throat> The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are coming into better balance. <clears throat> we believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle and that, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for longer, if appropriate. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we have seen on inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 
Of course, we're committed to both sides of our dual mandate, and an, une an unexpected weakening in the labor market could also warrant a policy response. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting. In our SCP, FOMC participants wrote down their individual assessments of an appropriate path for the federal funds rate based on what each participant judges to be the most likely scenario going forward. If the economy evolves as projected, the median participant projects that the appropriate level of the federal funds rate will be 4.6 percent at the end of this year, 3.9 percent at the end of 2025, and 3.1 percent at the end of 2026, still above the medium, median longer-term funds rate. These projections are not a committee decision or plan. If the economy does not evolve as projected, the path for policy will adjust as appropriate to foster our maximum employment and price stability goals. <clears throat> Turning to our balance sheet, our securities holdings have declined by nearly $1.5 trillion since the committee began reducing our portfolio. At this meeting, we discussed issues related to slowing the pace of decline in our securities holdings. While we did not make any decisions today on this, the general sense of the committee is that it will be appropriate to slow the pace of runoff fairly soon, consistent with the plans we previously issued. The decision to slow the pace of runoff does not mean that our balance sheet will ultimately shrink by less than it would otherwise, but rather allows us to approach that ultimate level more gradually. In particular, slowing the pace of runoff will help ensure a smooth transition reducing the possibility that money markets experience stress and thereby facilitating the ongoing decline in our securities holdings consistent with reaching the appropriate level of ample reserves. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keeping our longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and price stability over the long term. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect community and price stability over the long term. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission, employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the right. Steve Leesman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> the uh, Projections show somewhat higher core inflation. They also show uh, somewhat stronger growth. Um, what should we infer from this notion that on average rates were kept the same this year, but inflation is higher and growth is higher? Does it mean uh, more tolerance for higher inflation and less of a willingness to slow the economy to achieve that target? Well, it, it doesn't. No, it doesn't mean that. What, what it means is that you know we uh, we've seen incoming uh, as you, as uh, as I pointed out in my opening remarks, we did mark up our growth uh, forecast, and so have many other forecasters. So the economy is performing performing well, um, and the inflation data came in a little bit higher as a separate matter, and I think that caused people to write up uh, their their inflation. Uh, but nonetheless, we continue to make good progress on bringing inflation down, and uh, so. When, when you uh, just to follow up, when you say that you're willing to either maintain the rate for longer, is what is the tolerance of the Federal Reserve for inflation coming in above its two percent target? So we're we're strongly committed to bringing inflation down to two percent over time. That is that is our goal, and we will achieve that goal. Markets believe we will achieve that goal, and they should believe that because that that's what that's what will happen over over time. But we stress over time, and so. Um, I think we're, we're making projections that, that do show that happening, and we're, we're committed to that outcome, and we will bring it about. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You and others have been saying that relief on housing inflation is coming, but it still hasn't shown up meaningfully in the CPI or the PCE. Does that challenge your assumption about when the shift will finally break through, since it hasn't at that point? So I think there's some confidence that that, uh, that the market rents, lower market rent increases that we're seeing will show up in measures of housing uh, services inflation over time. There's a little bit of uncertainty about when that will happen, but there's real confidence that they will show up eventually uh, over time. But again, uncertainty about the exact timing of that. 
And will you be able to get overall inflation down to target if housing doesn't break through quickly? And does that affect the timing for eventual cuts this year? We will get aggregate inflation down to 2% over time. We will. And, and uh, I would assume that what we'll continue to see is we'll see goods prices coming into a new equilibrium where they're going down perhaps not as quickly as they had been earlier this year, uh, where housing services inflation will come back down as, as, as current market rents are suggesting will happen, and where non-housing services will move back down. Some combination of those three things, and it may be different from the combination we had before the pandemic, will be achieved and will bring inflation back down to 2% sustainably. Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Chair Powell, during your congressional testimony this month, you said that your test for making the first change to interest rates does not require you to be terribly comfortable that inflation is at 2% because interest rates are well above neutral. At the same time, you said here after the last meeting that the first cut is highly consequential. Can you reconcile these views for me? If rates are well above neutral, why would the first cut be highly consequential? Is that because you anticipate one cut would be followed by one or two more along the lines of the recalibration you made in 2019, which itself was modeled on the mid-cycle adjustment of 1995. It's more, I, I would put it more in the context of what I said in, our, in my opening remarks, that the, the risks are really two-sided here. We, we're, we're in a situation where, you know, if we, ease, uh, if we ease too much or too soon, we could see inflation come back. And if we ease too late, we could do unnecessary harm to employment and, uh, you know, people's working lives. And so, you know, we, we do see the risks as two-sided. So it, it is consequential. We want, we, we want to be careful. And fortunately, with the economy growing, with the labor market strong, and with inflation coming down, we can approach that question carefully and let the data speak on that. Uh, that that's really what I was thinking. How, how much of that inflation that we've seen so far this year do you chalk up to one-off calendar adjustment effects following a period of high inflation versus some change in the trend we saw uh, in the second half of last year. So I, I want to start by being saying you, I, I always try to be careful about dismissing uh, data that we don't like. So you need to check yourself on that, and I'll do that. But so, the, but the, I would say the January number, which was very high, the January CPI and PCE numbers were quite high. There's reason to think that that there could be seasonal effects there. Um, but nonetheless, we don't want to be completely dismissive of it. The February number was high higher than expectations, but we have it at, at currently well below 30 basis points core PCE, which is not terribly high. So it's not like the January number. But I take the two of them together, and I, I think they haven't really changed the overall story, which is that of inflation moving down gradually on a sometimes bumpy road toward 2%. I don't think that story has changed. Um, I also don't think that those, those readings added to anyone's confidence that we're moving closer to, to that point. But uh, you know, we didn't. I, I, last thing I'll say is we didn't um, uh, excessively celebrate the the good inflation readings we got in the last seven months of last year. We didn't um, take too much signal out of that. What you heard us saying was that we needed to see more. That we could, you know, we wanted to be careful about that decision, and we're not going to overreact as well to these these two months of data. Nor are we going to ignore them. Um, hi, yes, Chair Powell. Uh, I um, could you speak a little bit more about the timing? Uh, is there um, enough data uh, between now and say May to be able to get the kind of confidence that you say that you know you still need? Um, or by June, um, is there enough data for you? Just give us a sense of your thinking there. Thank you. Yeah, so we're, we're, we make decisions meeting by meeting, and we didn't make any decisions or uh, about about future meetings today. Uh, those are going to depend on our ongoing assessment of, of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risk. So I've, I really don't have anything for you on any specific meeting. Looking forward. But, I mean, just a question. Of, I mean, is there even enough data for you to be able to? We'll, we'll take, um, you know, th things can happen during an intermeeting period, if you look back unexpected things. So I don't want to, I wouldn't want to dismiss anything. So I just would say that the committee wants to see uh, more data that gives us higher confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward 2%. I also mentioned 
uh, and we don't see this in, in the data right now, but if there were a significant weakening in the data, particularly in the labor market, that could also be a reason for us to, to begin the process of reducing rates. Again, I don't, there's nothing in the data pointing at that, but those are the things that we'll be looking at at coming meetings and it, without, without trying to refer to any specific meeting. Hi, uh, Chris Regabert, Associated Press. Thank you. Um, in the projections, there is an increase in the neutral rate, as you know, and uh, higher rates, a quarter point higher rates projected in 2025, 2026. Um, can you speak about why might be behind that? Is there a real sense here that the economy has perhaps changed in some way that uh, higher rates will be needed in the future? Thank you. So. You're right, they're pretty modest changes, but you're right, there was an uptick in the, in the longer run rate, and, um, uh, and also there's a 25 basis point increase in, in 25 and 26. In terms of um, are rates gonna be higher in the, in the longer run, if that's really your question, I, I don't think we know that. Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's, we think that rates were generally low during the pre-pandemic, post-global financial crisis era for for reasons that are mostly, you know, uh, important, slow-moving, large things like demographics and productivity and, and, and that sort of thing, things that don't move quickly. Um, but I don't think we know. I mean, I, my, my instinct would be that rates will not go back down to the very low levels that we saw where all around the world there were long-run rates that were at or below zero. Uh, in some cases. I, I don't see rates going back down to that level, but I think there's tremendous uncertainty around that. Great, and just a quick follow. On the projections, you also have 2.6% uh, core inflation for the end of this year. Uh, it's already at, or you mentioned it being 2.8 in February. I mean, that doesn't sound like much disinflation at all. So are you really, are you still confident? Or <laughs> the last press conference, you sounded pretty optimistic. You would get more confidence to the end of this year. Um, it, is it right to say that this suggests you're not seeing a lot of disinflation this year compared to what we've seen 2023 and so, so forth? I think that that, that higher year-end um, number reflects the data we've seen so far this year, because you're now you're now in this year. So um, uh, I think that. Um, sorry, say your, say your last part of your question again. Well, just are you still <coughs> optimistic that you'll ah. get the confidence you need this year? I, I you know. I, I think if you look at if you look at the SCP, what it says is that um, it is still likely in in in, in most people's uh, view that we will achieve that confidence and that there will be rate cuts. But that's really going to depend on the on the incoming data. It is. Um, the other thing is in the second half of the the year, you have some pretty low readings, so it might be harder to make progress as you move that 12 month window forward. Nonetheless, um, we're looking for data that confirm the kind of low readings that we had last year uh, and, and give us a, a higher degree of confidence that what we saw was really inflation moving sustainably down to 2%, toward 2%. Uh, Gina Smilik, The New York Times, thank you for taking our questions. Uh, Per your comment to Ann that a weakening in the labor market would be a reason to potentially cut rates or at least a consideration in making a rate cut, would continued strength in the labor market be a reason to hold off on rate cuts? And just in general, if labor supply continued to rebound in 2024 the way it did in 2023, what would stronger hiring and possibly stronger growth mean for the path forward on policy? Yeah, so so if, we're, if what we're getting is um, a lot of supply and a lot of demand, and that supply is actually feeding demand because workers are getting paid and they're spending, and that's, you know, you, you, what you would have is potentially uh, kind of what you had last year, which is a bigger economy where, inf where inflationary pressures are not increasing. In fact, they were decreasing. So you can have that if you have the continued supply side uh, ac activity that we had last year with uh, both with um, supply chains and also with, with uh, growth in the size of the labor force. But so strong hiring in and of itself would not be a reason to hold off on rate cuts? No, not, not all by itself, no. I mean, we, we saw, you saw last year, very strong hiring, hiring and inflation coming down quickly. We now have a better sense that a big part of that was supply side healing, particularly with, with um, growth in the labor force. So in and of itself, strong job growth, growth is not a reason uh, you know, for us to be concerned about inflation. 
Neil. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin with uh, Axios. Uh, how do you assess the state of financial conditions right now? And in, particularly, in, in particular, do you uh, view the kind of easing in financial conditions since the fall as consistent and compatible with what you're trying to achieve on the inflation mandate? So we think <laughs> there are many different financial conditions indicators, and you can kind of, uh, you know, see different answers to that question. But ultimately, we do think that um, financial conditions are, are weighing on economic activity, and we think you see that in a great place to see it is in the labor market, where you've seen demand um, cooling off a little bit from the extremely high levels. And there I would point to job openings, quits, surveys, uh, the, 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 um, the hiring rate, things like that are really demand. There are also supply side things happening, but I think those are demand side things happening. Um, you know, we saw, that's been a question for a while. We did see progress on inflation last year, uh, significant progress, uh, despite, uh, you know, financial conditions sometimes being tighter, sometimes looser. Michael McGee with uh, <coughs> Bloomberg Radio and Television. Can you give us uh, more color uh, on how the committee is thinking about inflation dynamics now? Uh, what we've seen at the beginning of the year, are they more one-off increases that will fade, or is there more of a secular turn uh, with goods prices rising again and service prices staying sticky? And also, housing prices have been sort of the godot of this uh, cycle in that you keep expecting them to go down and they don't. Uh, how does the committee see this playing out forward since you've raised your uh, inflation forecast? So I, I see the committees looking at, at the two months of data and asking the same question you're asking and saying we're just going to have to see what the data show. Uh, as I mentioned, you can look at January, which is very high reading, and you can, and I think many, advise, many people did uh, see the possibility of seasonal adjustment problems there. But again, you don't want to, you got to be careful about dismissing the, the parts of the data that you don't like. So uh, yeah. um, then February wasn't, wasn't as high, but it was higher. So the question is, what are we going to see? You know, we tend to see a little bit stronger, this is in the data, a little bit stronger inflation in the first half of the year, a little bit less strong later in the year. We're going to, the, we're going to let the data um, show. I don't, I don't think we really know whether this is a bump on the road or something more. We'll have to find out. In the meantime, the economy is strong, the labor market is strong, uh, inflation has come way down, and that gives us the ability to approach this question carefully and, and you know, feel more confident that inflation is moving down sustainably at 2% when we take that step to begin dialing back uh, our restrictive policy. Well, you've talked about the, the desire to have confidence that inflation is continually moving down. Has the recent uh, numbers we've gotten for inflation data dented that confidence at all? It certainly hasn't improved our confidence. It hasn't raised anyone's confidence. But, confidence, but I, I would say that the, the, um, the story is really essentially the same, and that, and that is of inflation coming down gradually toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path, as I mentioned. I think that's what you still see. We've, we've got nine months of 2.5% inflation now, um, and we've had two months of kind of bumpy inflation. We, we were saying that we'll, it's going to be a bumpy ride. We consistently said that. Now here are some bumps, and the question is, are they more than bumps? And we just don't, we can't know that. Um, that's why we are approaching this question carefully. It is very important for everyone that we serve that we do get inflation sustainably down. And uh, I think the, the historical record, you know, it's every situation is different, but the historical record is that you, you need to approach that question carefully and, and try to get it right the first time and not have to come back uh, and raise rates again, perhaps, if you, if you cut inappropriately, prematurely. Go to Edward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Edward Lawrence uh, with Fox Business. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you received a, a letter from, um, well, the Federal Reserve is an independent body, understanding Congress has oversight over that. You received a letter from Senators Elizabeth Warren and Sheldon Whitehouse that said, um, calling on you to lower interest rates, to cut interest rates, because it says, quote, the potential that it may remain too high for too long has halted advances in deploying renewable energy technologies and delayed significant climate and economic benefits from these projects. So has higher interest rates caused that? 
have they, well, first of all, I respect our, you know, we, in our system of government, it is Congress that has oversight responsibility over the Fed. We place a tremendous amount of importance on our engagements with Congress and always treat them with, with great respect. Um, in, in this case, I would say those are, you know, our mandate, our mandate is for maximum employment and price stability and the other things that we do. Uh, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to do that in a way that sustains the strong growth we're seeing, the strong labor market we're seeing, but allows us to make further progress with inflation. That's how we can best serve the public and leave the other issues, in, which in many cases are incredibly important, such as those you mentioned, leave those to the people who have responsibility for those. There was another letter from two dozen lawmakers <clears throat> saying that the higher rates are squeezing the working people. How do these letters affect what you guys are doing policy-wise? We, we, we receive these, respect, these letters with respect, and we write careful responses and address concerns. We listen, again, because we're talking to the people who, in our system of government, have oversight over our activity. So that's, but, but at, the, at the end of the day, we take that on board, but we have to make our judgments and we have to stick to our knitting, which is maximum employment, price stability, supervise and regulate the banks, work on the payment system, the things that we do. Um, Thank you. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, as, as chair of the FOMC, would you want to see unanimity on the committee or something close to it, meaning no more than one dissent before you begin cutting rates? Thank you. I, I, we're a very consensus-oriented uh, organization, and we do try to achieve con, uh, consensus and, and ideally unanimity. People do dissent. It's something that happens. Life goes on. And it's not a problem. We've always had dissents, uh, but and so I, you know, and you, you, you respect thoughtful dissents very much. Um, it's like you, you may not agree with with some arguments, but you really want to understand them. So you may read a book that takes a position that you, that you have long opposed, just to understand that book. So I, I treat dissents with with real respect as well. So Simon. <laughs> Uh, Simon Urbanovich with The Economist. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, obviously, inflation is some ways away from target. Uh, <clears throat> unemployment, though, if you look at the projection for the full year, 4.0%. Uh, in February, uh, we were already at 3.9%, so quite close to the median projection. Are you concerned at all that notwithstanding the very strong jobs growth, um, that in fact there may be some cracks appearing in the employment market? Uh, you talked about a significant deterioration in the labor market being a condition for, for easing rates. What would constitute uh, that in your books? Thank you. So uh, we, of course, monitor the, it's one of our two goal variables. We, we all monitor the labor market very, very carefully. And I, I don't see those cracks today. And, and we, you know, we follow all the possible stories that are out there about, about there being cracks. But the, the overall picture really is strong labor market, the extreme imbalances that we saw in the early uh, parts of the pandemic recovery have mostly been resolves, resolved. You're seeing high job growth. You're seeing big increases in supply. You're seeing strong wage growth, but wage growth is gradually moderating down to more sustainable levels. Uh, in many, many respects, um, the, the uh, things are returning more to the, their state in 2019, which we can think of as normal for this purpose. That's job openings and quits, and surveys of workers and, and businesses are always interesting on this. You know, how tight is the, how easy is it to find a job? How hard is, how easy it is to find a worker? Those have both, those surveys have both come down. So the labor market's in, it's in good shape. Um, you know. Uh, you do see things like the low, uh, the low hiring rate, and people have made the argument that if if um, if layoffs were to increase, uh, that that would that would mean that the net would be fairly quick increases in unemployment. So that's something we're watching, but we're not seeing it. Of course, um, initial claims are are very very low, and if anything, have tracked tracked down a little bit. So, watching it carefully, don't see it. And when I say uh, something, I, I, I use the term unexpected weakening in the labor market. So, you know, uh, we do expect the unemployment rate to 
you know, the forecast is that it would move up, I think, closer to what we see as the longer run sustainable level. That's just a, that's just people's forecast, individual forecasts. But um, we're talking about something that's unexpected. That's, that's where I'll leave it, though. Steve. Uh, Steve Matthews with Bloomberg. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the press conference that it, that the committee felt it might be appropriate to slow the pace of asset runoff fairly soon. I'm wondering, is when you say fairly soon, does that mean that the committee would uh, meet about this again in May and a decision could be reached that soon? And I was wondering if you could also just describe the, the scope of what the committee is discussing here. You're at $95 billion of, of uh, uh, caps right now. Would that be cut about in half or something in that nature? Thank you. Um, so that is what we're discussing essentially is, is – um, and we're not discussing all the other many other balance sheet issues. We will discuss those in the in due course. But what we're really looking at is is uh, slowing the pace of runoff. There isn't much runoff among MBS in MBS right now, but there is in Treasuries, and we're talking about going to a lower pace. I don't want to give you a specific number because we haven't made a, a, a haven't made, had an agreement or a decision. But that's that's the idea, um, and uh, that's what we're looking at. And, and the, in terms of the timing, I said fairly soon. I wouldn't want to try to be more specific than that, but you get the idea. Um, the, the idea is, and this is in our, in our longer run plans, that we may actually be able to get to a lower level because we would avoid the kind of frictions that can, can happen. It, liquidity is not evenly distributed in the system. And there can be times when, in the aggregate, reserves are, are ample or even abundant but not in every part. And, and those, those parts where they're not ample, there can be stress. And that can cause you to prematurely stop the process to avoid the stress. And then it would be very hard to restart, we think. So as something like that happened in, in 19, perhaps. So, um, so that's what we're doing. We're looking at what would be a good time and what would be a good structure. And you know, fairly soon is words that we use to mean fairly soon. And will there be a discussion about returning to an all treasuries balance sheet at some point? So that our our longer run goal is is to a return to a a balance sheet that is mostly treasuries. I do expect that once we're through this, um, we'll we'll come back to the other issues about the composition and the maturity, and revisit those issues. But it's you know not urgent right now. We want to get want to get this uh, this decision made first, and then we can, when the time is right, come back to the other issues. Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, also on the balance sheet, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how the outlook for the banking sector might impact your balance sheet plans? Do you worry that as deposits start to shrink that we could see more turbulence? You know, we'll, we'll be watching carefully, but one of the reasons we're, we're slowing down, we, we will soon enough, uh, fairly soon, I should say, slow down is that uh, we want to avoid any any kind of uh, of of that of turbulence i wasn't thinking particularly about about banking sector turbulence but um we and we we had some indicators uh the last time this is our second time in in, in doing this and i think we're we're going to be paying a lot of attention to the the things that started to happen and, and that foreshadowed what eventually happened at, at the end of that tightening cycle where we, where we wound up in, in a short reserve situation. And we don't want to do that again. And I think now we have a better sense of what are the indicators. It, isn't, it wasn't so much in the banking system as it was around, for example, um, where federal funds is trading relative to the administered rates and where, where secured rates are relative to the, to the administered rates, those sorts of things. We will always be watching the banking system for, for similar signs, though. Well, is it also because you're not sure exactly how the reserve supply will react once the overnight reverse repo facility, you know, drops nearer at zero? I, well, I think we broadly think that once the overnight repo uh, stabilizes either at zero or close to zero, that as the balance sheet shrinks, we should expect that reserves will decline pretty close to dollar for dollar with that. That's what we think. Let's go to Gene. Hi, Chair Powell. Jean Young with m and Market News. Um, I wanted to ask also about the balance sheet. Um, 
Well, you you said that starting the taper sooner could get to get you to a smaller balance sheet size. Um, does that mean you don't have to make a decision on when to end QT at this point? And and um, will you be setting up um, the process for deciding that sooner, or, or will you wait until we're close to the end? So uh, it's sort of ironic that by going slower you can get farther. But that's the idea. The the idea is that. Um, y y with a smoother transition, you won't, you'll run much less risk of uh, kind of liquidity problems, which can grow into shocks and which can cause you to stop the process prematurely. So, so that's, that's where, in terms of how it ends, um, we're going to be monitoring carefully uh, money market conditions and asking ourselves wh wh whether they, what they're telling us about reserves. Are they, from, we, right now we would characterize them as abundant and what we're aiming for is ample, and you know, which is a little bit less than abundant, right? So um, there isn't a, you know, there's not a dollar amount or a percent of GDP or anything like that where we, we think we have a really pretty clear understanding of that. We're going to be we're going to be looking at what what these, you know, what's happening in money markets, uh, in particular, a, a, a bunch of different indicators, including the ones I mentioned, to tell us when we're getting close. Then, though, you, re you reach a point ultimately where you stop uh, allowing the balance sheet to run off and you but then from that point there's another period in which non-reserves li non-reserve liabilities grow organically like currency and that also shrinks the reserves at a very slow pace so you have a you have a you know a, a slower pace of runoff uh, which will have uh, fairly soon then you have another time where you where you you effectively hold the balance sheet constant and allow non-reserve liabilities to expand. And then, and then that, that ultimately brings you ideally in for, you know, bring, brings it into a, a nice easy landing uh, at, an, at a level that is above, you know, above what we think the lowest possible ample number would be. We're not trying for that. We're, we're, we want to have a, a cushion, a buffer, because we know that demand for uh, reserves can be very volatile. And we, we don't want to, again, find ourselves in a situation where there aren't reserves. We have to turn around and, you know, buy assets and put reserves back in the banking system the way we did in 2019-20. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Chair Paul, um, you said you're waiting to become more confident that inflation is getting to your 2% goal before you cut rates. Can you just sum up more specifically what data you're looking at that would give you that confidence? Sure. So we're, most importantly, we're looking at the incoming inflation data and the contents of it and what they're telling us. So that'll be, and also the, the various components. So obviously that's what we want. We want more confidence that inflation uh, is coming down sustainably toward 2%. Uh, and I mean, it, it, of course, we'll also be looking at all the other things that are happening in the economy. We'll look at the totality of the data, including everything, essentially, as we make that assessment. But the most important thing will be the inflation data that's coming in. Well, are there things that you would give more weight to, like wages? Wages is one thing. We don't. Our, our target is not wages. It's really inflation. We w but we would we would look to the fact that. Um, Wages are still coming in very strong, but but they've been wage increases. That is to say, wage increases have been have been quite strong, but they're they're gradually coming down to levels that uh, are more sustainable over time, and and that's what we want. Uh, we don't think that the inflation was not originally caused. We think I don't think by by mostly by by wages. That wasn't really the story. Um, but we do think that to get inflation back down to 2% sustainably, we'd like to see, you know, continuing gradual movement of wage increases at, at still high levels, but back down to levels that are, that are more sustainable over time. Thank you, uh, Greg Robb from MarketWatch. Chair Powell, could you say at this meeting whether there were more of officials who wanted to be careful and go slower than about rates than were in at the last meeting was there was there that sense of maybe it's a, it's smart to to wait thanks i, I guess i'd put it this way um, the if you look at the incoming inflation data that we've had 
for January and February. I think very broadly that um, suggests that we, we were right to, to wait until we're more confident. So I think, I think you know, I, I didn't hear anyone dismissing it as, as not information that we should look at or anything like that. So I think generally speaking, it does go in the direction of saying, yes, it's, it's, it's appropriate for us to be careful as we approach this question. Brendan. Thanks, Chair Powell. Brendan Peterson with Punchbowl News. Um, I wanted to ask you about central bank digital currency stuff. Um, we've been hearing a lot from Republicans in Congress about what the Fed is or isn't doing in a digital dollar. Um, but, folks, I know you have said to Congress that you are going to wait for approval before the Fed does anything, uh, launches anything. But folks like House Majority Whip Tom Emmer have said that the Fed is either actively researching or hiring personnel to study the implications of the CBDC. Can you give us any clarity on what the Fed is doing right now on a digital dollar? Sure. So I think we've been pretty transparent on this, but I will, uh, I'll try harder. Um, so we, uh, we are not getting ready to, we haven't proposed, we haven't come to a conclusion that we should propose or anything like that, a, th that Congress consider legislation to authorize a digital dollar. And it would take legislation by Congress signed by the president to, to give us the ability to do the, what we think of as a CBDC, which is really a retail CBDC with, with the public. Of it. So, so we're just a long, long way from that. What we are doing, and I think what every major central bank is doing, is we're, we're trying to stay in the frontiers of what's going on in digital finance. And it has many, many different uh, areas. You know, it, it has applications in wholesale finance, in, in the payment system. And so we need we to serve the public. We need we're, these these issues have become very front burner in the last five or six years. We need to be knowledgeable about all that. So we, we actually do have people trying to understand things that are. But but it's wrong to say that we're working on a CBDC and then we've got secretly got a lab here where we've got one and we're just going to spring it on Congress at the right moment. We don't. Not I, I haven't at, at all in my own mind. Uh, made a decision that I think this is something the U.S. should be doing. Uh, you know, I just think it's something we need to be, we need to understand. And we do have people who are keeping up with that as part of the broader payments landscape. That's, that's how I would characterize it. Mark. Thank you. It's Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. Mr. Chairman, April 27th will mark the 13th anniversary since a Fed chairman began holding regular news conferences. How important has that higher transparency been in your view, both for the proper functioning of the central bank uh, and also in accomplishing your mission? And is there more that you and your colleagues can do on the transparency front? And what might that look like? I, I generally think um, I mean, this, this movement actually started, you know, 30 years ago, more 30 years ago, um, when some academics uh, posited that a more transparent central bank, if the public understands your reaction function, the markets will do your work for you. They'll react to the data. And, and so it all happens that way. And so there's been a march toward greater and greater transparency. And um, that certainly Chairman Bernanke advanced that. So Chairman Greenspan did, uh, Chair Yellen did. And I, you know, so we went from Four, four press conferences a year to eight, so now every, every meeting really is live now. I think that's a good innovation. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to turn it back. We also have done a bunch of other things. Uh, you know, we've, we have an annual uh, supervision report, financial stability report. Um, I mean, there's a long list of things that we've done. I think you, um, I mean, nothing comes to mind as really desperately in need of doing at this moment. We're very transparent. We have no shortage of FOMC participants speaking to the public through the media. And so that, that channel is full, I would say. Um, so I think, I think it's generally broadly helped and made things better, but not every day and in every way. Well, to follow up, has there ever been a day where you wanted to put that genie back in the bottle somewhat? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Jennifer for the last question. Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Finance. Uh, 
not to harp too much more on confidence and in inflation, but she did say earlier in this press conference that the recent inflation data hasn't raised anyone's confidence. But when you testified before the Senate a couple weeks ago, you told lawmakers that you are, quote, not far from receiving the confidence needed on inflation to begin cutting rates. So are you still of that belief or not? What are we to take by those words, not far? So let me say my, my main message at that um, uh, in those two days of hearings was really that the, com the committee needs to see more evidence to build our confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our 2% goal. And we don't expect that it will be appropriate to begin to reduce rates until we're more confident that that is the case. I, that that is the case. I said that any number of times. So those were kind of the main part of the message. We repeated that today uh, in our statement. I also, to the language you mentioned, I, I, I really pointed out that we had made significant progress over the past year. And what we're looking for now is confirmation that that progress will continue. Um, uh, we had a series of, inf of um, inflation readings over the second half of last year that were, that were really uh, much lower. Uh, we didn't overreact, as I mentioned, but that, that's what I had in mind. But given that you said that PCE for February, 2.8%, the estimate, and that we have been seeing PCE, core PCE, coming down by a tenth of a percent every month, I mean, wouldn't you be at about 2.4% this summer, June, July, to a point where you could cut then? Well, you know, we'll just have to see how the data, uh, how the data come in. Um, we would, of course, love to get great inflation data. We got really good inflation data on the second, in the second part of last year. Again, we didn't overreact to it. We said we needed to see more, and uh, we said it would be bumpy. And now we have January and February, which I've talked about a couple of times. So, you know, we're looking for, for more good data, and we would certainly welcome it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for Mr. JP, guys. That is Jerome Powell right there. Appreciate everybody joining up today for the live stream. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? I'll listen to that elevator music go. Oh, we're going to turn on our own music here. Let me get that off. But yeah, let's go, guys. That was a pretty good event. At the end of the day, the market really ran higher, and that's great to see. The FedWatch tool shows, shows that the cuts are coming in June and they kind of swung higher towards being a cut so that's actually a really good sign from today i'm really happy to see that you can see that the may meeting is also sitting right around a uh, pause as well slightly more towards a cut than it actually was heading into today so overall we're seeing a lot of pretty crazy moves out there uh the spies running up we're seeing a lot of tech stocks boom higher as well apple Microsoft, NVIDIA, and others are really starting to get up there. Really cool to see these stocks running the way that they are. What's going on here? Okay. Thought my drawings got messed up. Yeah, we're looking good. The market's running higher. I like this uptrend. We're up to 520 on the SPY during that time. So how's everybody like it out there? Did you like the event? That was a pretty badass poll that we did earlier. 100 votes. Not sure we ever got to 100 before. Alexa, play the bull. Yeah, seriously, right? Jason, I saw that. I saw it. I don't know what the hell that means. <laughs> it had me scared to, to post it. <laughs> It, it looks funny, though. 520 spy put expiration tomorrow. No way. I would not do that, Andy. That is pretty freaky. I would not do that right now at all. That momentum's more to the upside. And at the end of the day, I mean, buying a short-term expiration like that, holding it into the next day, is a total gamble. It's like betting on red or black. But I'll say this, with the overall uptrend, I would lean more green than I would red today, but. Yeah, it's worse than red or black, exactly. Palantir's up, really? Nice. 
Got some growth stocks going today. I'm glad to see Palantir having a fantastic one. That's a good move. What about DraftKings? Oh, yeah. 4580. Like to see that. Disney? Nice. 11620 out of Disney. New highs of the year, I believe. Yep. Look at that on the daily. Looking pretty. Gotta love it. Got to love it. But yeah, here we go, guys. We're getting towards the end of the day, though, so I do have to go and get some stuff going. Make sure you guys check out tonight's video. It's going to be really awesome. Going to go over a lot of what Powell said and just the overall price action and bullishness that is going on right now. So a lot of good news in the short term, especially when you look at the FedWatch tool. Gotta love that. Do you guys ever do mid or long term options plays? Yes, we do, Darth. In the premium channel. A lot of the big money plays are, are uh, longer term plays. And those are the ones that I really like to look at. Make sure you watch tonight's video. Darth will have a couple. Well, we will have one big money play in tonight's video. Towards the end. But yeah, let's go guys. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I really enjoy doing that live stream. You always got to love whenever Powell speaks. I love our tradition heading into the event as well. But let's go. Let's have a fantastic end of the week over the next two days. Don't forget about the live Q&A tonight. You have to be a member of the trading floor to have access to the live Q&A. So make sure you join up on the trading floor. Be there tonight at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Let's go, guys. Hopefully, I see you there tonight. If not, I'll see you on the live stream tomorrow morning at open. Have a great one.